All right. I uh, was asked to talk a little bit about what is happening in New York, and specifically with a focus on nitrogen management and implementing an adaptive nitrogen management approach uh, for New York. I want to recognize I'm working very closely to my, with my colleague Carl Zimmick uh, at Cornell University on this, uh, and I will uh, hopefully make the case that we, it's not just two of us, but we have a whole slew of people we work with within agencies, farmer communities, farm advisors, and the industry as well. A little bit of an uh, outline here, just to keep people organized, including myself. Um, real quick sketch of New York agriculture and the type of uh, questions we deal with within New York. My role at the university, a little bit of a history and nutrient management within the state of New York, and then I'll talk about uh, what we did to implement an adaptive management program in the state of New York. And then the next steps and some, uh, hopefully some lessons learned that might be of relevance to other states that might be thinking about something similar. So New York State um, is a dairy state, different from some of the other states. Actually, before I continue, can you uh, shout out which states are represented in this audience here? Delaware. Delaware? All right. Am I the only one from New York? Yeah. Yep. All right. I thought it was lo I thought it was lonely on the road. <laughs> All right. Um, many of you are familiar though with New York probably and uh, know that it's uh, among the top uh, three, three or four, depending on the year, dairy states in the, in the U.S. Uh, a lot of our cropping systems in the state of New York are focused on feeding the animal industry, and particularly forages. So our most common crop rotation in New York is three to four years of corn grown for silage, rotated with hay fields that could be uh, alfalfa, grass. Uh, most of them are mixed alfalfa grass stands. We do have some other crops that uh, have significant acreages, but uh, corn is a really important forage crop for us. Uh, it used to be that we grew more silage than grain. I think it's flipped a little bit in the state of New York. Uh, so we have both significant acres that are harvested for grain, and we have a significant acreage that's harvested for silage for, uh, for the dairy forage uh, supply. So agriculture in New York um, is important. This is a distribution map that our regulatory agency has on the website, the DEC, New York State Department of Environment and Conservation, is the regulator in the state of New York. Um, the dots on this map are the animal feeding operations, uh, particularly the CAFOs, so those that meet the minimum size limits. Currently in New York, 200, uh, this map I think is 200 still, it's 300 cows an acre, 300 cows per farm or more uh, that is plotted on here. There are many, many more farms than you see on this map. What I wanted to point out with this map is that you see the farms distributed throughout the landscape in the state of New York with the exception of the Adirondack Mountains. Not a lot of farming happening there. Um, but pretty, and not a lot of dairy farms in, uh, in Long Island either. <laughs> but you see the rest of the state from east to west to north to south, there is animal agriculture throughout the state of New York. Now, if you keep the picture of where these, these operations are and really imagine that there are many more dots on the map than this, and you look at the map of where the water resources are in the state of New York, you might start realizing the importance of making sure that what we do on the land base protects our water resources. This map is not just the rivers and lakes, it is also the underground aquifers, and it is what supplies drinking water to both the big cities and the local municipalities. New York City, as an example, um, gets uh, drinking water supplied, among others, from the uh, Kennesville Reservoir, um, there's a decision made that it, uh, it needed to, the agriculture needed to keep the surface and the, and the groundwater protected so that New York City didn't have to put very expensive filtration and treatment systems in place to supply drinking water to the millions living there. It's not just New York City, all the major cities are also tapping out of rivers and, not rivers, out of the reservoirs and the, and the lakes. So it is really important for the economy in the state of New York to keep this water as clean as possible. And that put great emphasis on how we manage the landscape um, throughout the state. It's not just agriculture, it's a lot of other sectors as well, but agriculture is a partner in all of this. And then, it took me six hours to get here this morning. 
for most farmers in New York, that's like way away. <laughs> um, but we have a portion in the Chesapeake Bay. The southern tier of New York is the headwaters of the Chesapeake Bay. The upper Susquehanna uh, watershed that is listed in the boxes here is part of New York. So whether we want it or not in New York, uh, we are connected to the Chesapeake Bay. And there is a realization that what happens on the landscape in part of New York also trickles through, through the rest of the bay. Therefore, for most of our, our work, we also have made connections with the, the rest of the Chesapeake Bay states to see if we can, what we can do to help with ag and environmental management. So my role at Cornell, this thing is very uh, sensitive. <laughs> um, I joined Cornell 19 years ago. And my job description uh, said that I was to provide leadership for the Nutrient Management Extension Program of the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences at Cornell. It was a 70% uh, extension and 30% uh, research position. And the aim, according to my job description, was that the program should improve grower and agriculture industry awareness of crop nutrient needs, crop quality, management of organic wastes, environmentally sound nutrient management practices, and overall soil fertility management. If I had to write that job description again today, I would change one word. Anybody guess what it is? Waste. Waste. What would you turn it into? A resource. Right. What we've been trying to do within our program is to try to figure out how we can turn something that the general public considers a waste into something that's actually a tremendous resource and how we can better balance that for, for use at the farms uh, overall. So this was my job description, 70% research, 70% extension, sorry, 30% research, basically means that I had to do something useful for the state of New York. And as I mentioned, I recognize my colleague Carl Zimmick up front there. Um, I'm not uh, doing this by myself. Um, we have a group of people, we have a team we work with uh, to do this, but this is basically my, my job description at the university. Organic resources. Yes. Yeah. So we started what we call the Nutrient Management Spear Program. That's just the name of the program that we run. And program means all our activities. It's not a software thing. Everything we do is under the header of the Nutrient Management Spear Program. The overall goal of this program is to enhance farm productivity while protecting um, the environment for the long-term sustainability of animal agriculture in New York. We have a website. If you want to figure out what, uh, what sort of the projects are we do, I'll point out a few, few links as I go through the presentation. But um, we try to keep that website as updated as, as, as we can. The key on this slide is productivity and environmental protection, not one or the other. It's both. We're looking for the win-win scenarios as much as we can. To be able to do that, we set up a program that's a collaboration among a lot of different players in the state of New York. And depending on the topic that we work on, it could be all of them, it could be a few of them, but we try to engage with all our stakeholders in the state of New York, and we also try to integrate extension teaching and research very closely. Partly that is in terms of the student education to get them interested in agriculture, in uh, uh, sectors, jobs, um, understand the trade-offs and the possibilities in terms of production and uh, environmental protection. And also because we don't want to be spending three years of doing research on research stations and then go out in the state and give talks for the next three years and then conclude six years later that nobody was listening. Rather than that, we thought, okay, we go to the farms. We want to know what, what, uh, what the questions are. We want to see what the challenges are and then work together to address those. So almost all of our research is on farm, in on farm research networks and not so much on the research station. If it needs to be more detailed, more complicated, more treatments and everything else, of course we do that on the research station. But uh, most of our work happens on farm. All right, so I mentioned the ultimate goal is impact. What we are looking for is to develop and implement beneficial management practices at the field level, at the farm level. We want to engage farmers, as I mentioned, in on-farm research, 
because in my view, that is what gets uh, changes made in, the f in, in future years. It's not so much what we monkey around with on research stations. It's uh, working together. We want to train the students in multidisciplinary projects, including research, extension, teaching all together. And we want to contribute to agriculture and environmental management <coughs> policy. And the last one sounds a little scary to some people, but it is really important um, in our view. So our direct audience are the farmers, the crop consultants, the agricultural uh, um, industry in general, but also our agency folks, people that we want to work with that make decisions about what farmers need to do on their land base. And we want those decisions to be as grounded in reality as we can. And we think the university can have a contribution to that mission. Now, Tom mentioned we need to publish. Um, and that's absolutely true. I started out as an assistant professor, and if I don't publish, I don't get tenure. This is long behind me. I've been there 19 years now, so it's well past. Um, but we still need to publish because we do need scientific credibility. And we need to be certain that the conclusions we draw from the research are valid, right? So we still have, we still publish a lot, but that, I tell everybody in our team, that's not our ultimate goal. Our ultimate goal is a change in management that is better for the farmer, that's better for the environment. A policy impl implementation in the state of New York that people can live with and that actually is effective and doable. And students that are trained to help the agricultural industry move forward in a more sustainable way um, over the long term. All right, so ultimate goal impact. A little bit of history. In New York, back in the middle, uh, uh, mid 90s, there was a lawsuit, western part of New York. A farm was sued for polluting water by its neighbors. And this went to court. And the judge made a decision. And the judge said the farm is at fault. I gave the farm a fine. And under that structure of the law, the farmer also had to pay the lawyer fee for the environmental neighbors that were complaining about what the farm was doing. And the whole core of this lawsuit was that the farm should have a permit to farm. Now the farmer response was, um, where do I get that permit? There was no permit to be had. So there was no way this farm could have gotten the permit because it didn't exist. There was no permitting system in place whatsoever. You can imagine this upset the agricultural industry big time. And this particular farm was a very well-managed farm also, not, not a scenario of somebody blatantly dismissing uh, environmental concerns. So agricultural groups pressed the state of New York, the regulator, the Department of Environmental Conservation, to develop a CAFO permit for the state of New York. That was the foundation of our CAFO permit. It was put in place in 99, just before I started uh, working at Cornell. Um, gave farms five years uh, to comply. Now full compliance is required for every farm that meets the CAFO uh, size qualifications, so um, 300 cows or more. Um, and there are other limits for poultry and hog industry. And uh, this permit is uh, also required for farms that are in a sensitive watershed or somehow tap into cost sharing programs federal or state cost sharing programs. This permit, the CAFO permit in the state of New York, relies in part on NRCS standards, natural resources conservation standards. How many of you are familiar with the 590 standard? Most of you, all right. So the 590 standard, NRCS 590 standard, uh, refers to the Land Grant University guidelines in New York. And the Land Grant University in New York is Cornell University. Those guidelines are related to fertility management, so nitrogen recommendations, phosphorus, potassium recommendations, soil pH management, um, field-based risk assessment tools, so the nitrogen leaching index that we have in place and the phosphorus index that we have in the state of New York and that will be updated in a couple of weeks. And things related to manure management decisions. You have to sample manure, you have to sample soil, uh, follow protocols, these type of things. This 590 standard for the state of New York 
is basically saying, thou shall do what the land-grant university tells thou to do. Isn't that nice? That's where my job fits in. That's where this job description fits in, right? Um, so we at the university have to make sure that our guidelines are realistic, are doable, are practical, um, and that we put up a system that people can use and that can move us forward in terms of production and environmental protection at the same time. I looked up that document. They are revising it now. Um, this is from 2013. That's currently active. Uh, this is the website for New York. And I looked up this document, and it cites Cornell 47 times. And if I looked at, well, yeah, it's 14 pages. So that's like three, four times a page. Um, these references are all going to the guidelines that are developed for the state of New York. Now, I, I inherited those 19 years ago, right? What we need, did need to do from the beginning was make sure that we knew what those guidelines were. So in the first couple of years, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out where the algorithms are, what the guidelines are, how do we go from input to a recommendation. And we spent a lot of time writing documents to document this so that the consultants in the state of New York could pick that up, build it in their own software, and be compliant. This website is our program website, Nutrient Management Spear program website, and it lists all the documents. And if you go to the main page, you see the one on the left. Under the featured links, the second one is Cornell Nutrient Guidelines for Field Crops. And if you click on that, you get the screen on the right. And on the right, it has the documents that are part of uh, uh, the, the CAFO regulation system as well. We are redoing um, several of the documents now, as you will notice when I <laughs> talk about the adaptive management process that uh, some changes are happening. Um, but basically, this website is the core access for uh, consultants in the state of New York to the Cornell guidelines. Now, it was supposed to be about nitrogen, right? So uh, first recognition that any soil scientist will make is that managing nitrogen is difficult. And part of the reason for that is that nitrogen is so dynamic. It has so many different forms, and it can change from one form in another. And they all behave differently. So we're looking to get nitrate in the soil at the time that the plants can take it up and really need it, and not when there's nothing growing that can take it up. Because when it's in nitrate form and nothing is there to take it up, the weather can take care of it and leach it out or make it uh, disappear up in the air. So it's hard to predict the relationships uh, between all these forms, between the weather, nitrogen availability, and nitrogen loss. What we consider our guidelines to be is foundational. It is a nitrogen management planning tool um, in terms of uh, CAFO planning. So people need to make decisions up front about how much manure to apply, most of the time even before a seed goes in the ground. Um, and we need to get estimates for both the uptake of nitrogen and the supply of nitrogen. Those of you that heard Tom's talk earlier, the yield goal times 1.2 as a simple recommendation system ignores that second component, the supply side. Right? It, might, it might get you to an estimate of a crop uptake, but it certainly doesn't estimate the, uh, the supply side of things. And we have many resources, sources of nutrients, nitrogen uh, specific. Um, Nitrogen fixation for the legumes, for corn, that doesn't apply, not until breeders figure that one out. Uh, but we have nitrogen deposition uh, from the air, and then most of us are familiar with uh, the, the nitrogen sources that we deal with um, and that we can manage, including the amount of nitrogen in the soil in terms of soil organic matter that can be mineralized over time. Crop residues and roots that uh, contribute to nitrogen supply. Manure applications in the past, manure applications uh, planned for the current year and then the fertilizer applications. And all of these sources um, for animal operations are important. We have a crop operation and no animal uh, manure supply. Obviously, that part is crossed out, uh, but it's still a, a tricky thing to get right. This is the recommendation system that we inherited. It's basically the Stanford equation. 
that uh, tries to go in the direction of a fuel balance. It says yield potential in bushels per acre multiplied by 1.2 minus what we expect the soil to supply through nitrogen mineralization of organic matter, so soil N in pounds an acre, minus salt N, which meant crop rotation credits. So first year corn after all fall for grass doesn't need um, as much nitrogen as third or fourth year corn after a hay field because the, the biomass from the previous sod, the roots and what was left above ground will contribute to that nitrogen supply. So sod rotations, hay rotations, um, we also build in uh, soybean credits, cover crop credits in this over time. So we take yield potential times one per two, we subtract what we think we get for free in terms of sod and soil N, and then we divide that by the fertilizer uptake efficiency. And the fertilizer uptake efficiency is a number that recognizes that if you apply 100 pounds of nitrogen, you're not going to get 100 pounds all of that into the plant. There are inefficiencies. Fertilizer cannot be used 100% efficient. So we need to take that into account, and that's why it's there um, in the equation as well. Of course, we take also into account uh, the past uh, manure credits and any, any current manure credits. But this is the core recommendation, foundational recommendation, um, that is in our system at Cornell University that we inherited and that we've been testing along the way. So how do we get those numbers, all of those numbers? Well, the first one is the yield potential one. Um, when we started looking at what it was defined as, it said three to four years out of five under good management. So it dismisses uh, the drought year that might have resulted in 70% of your yield or something. It says three out of four years out of five under good management is what we define as a yield potential. And then if you go to the soils database that uh, um, you see a small portion of here, every soil type in the state of New York has a value for yield potential, drained and undrained, for soil and supply, drained and undrained, for um, uptake efficiency, and then we have a different table for the rotation credits and the soybean credits and the cover crop credits. We have just shy under 600 soil types in the state of New York. So every soil type is listed in this database with an estimate of their yield potential based on this definition. Now, when we started working at Cornell, um, there were two options that the state, in collaboration with my predecessor at Cornell, um, had agreed upon. And these were the two options for regulated farms. CAFO regulations came in place in 99. The two options were use this equation, use the book values, plug in your numbers, and that's it. The second option was if you have your own yield data, you need three years of data and the current nitrogen guidelines, you can use the average of those three years and plug that in the same equation. If that number is higher than our book values, you can use that number and override it, uh, still using the equation. Right? So that has been in place for 19 years now. Bit of a challenge with this. Does anybody see it coming? 600 soil types goes from sand to heavy clays. It is grouped in six soil series, but there's still a lot of management uh, or differences within each of these soil series. We have these yield potentials per soil type with and without drainage. We had no money to update this thing. So the last updates to this database were made just before I started working, just before my predator retired, 20 years ago. And that raises some questions. So along the way, as we were asking people, what do you want us to do? What, what are the bigger questions we want us uh, to address? Um, people started raising the yield potential and said, these numbers in the database look extremely low. We are much better now than 20 years ago. And that's reflected in terms of, of general trends and all the improvements we've seen since the Second World War with better genetics, better management, everything else. The yields both for corn silage and corn grain have gone up if you look at the longer term trend since uh, the Second World War. You'll see this in other places too. This is what we see over the last 20 years. 
15 years, sorry, can't count, 15 years. So if you squint well enough, you might see a slightly upward trend for grain, for silage, and actually for both of them, what we see is the weather, things going up and down, right? So the weather is overriding any trends that we might be seeing in yields over this time period. Somehow we are not getting there, uh, even though we know the potential is there, the yield potential, the yield uh, uh, competition winners are, are I don't know, what, the, what are they around here? 300 something? Say it again? 140? That's not the, the yield potential winners, right? That's not the competition winners? 300 something, whatever it is, um, way above the averages for the state. Um, so valid, valid questions related to you know, the yield potential database, does it need to be updated? Absolutely, we need to look at these things, but we had some challenges. Issues that surfaced over the last many years was that some consultants under the regulatory system in the state of New York working with the regulated farms increased their nitrogen rates by plugging in higher yield numbers without having the documentation to back it up. And that is a danger to both the consultant and the farmer and the environment. Somebody comes in and checks, then um, they're out of compliance, right? So that was an issue. Um, Increasing rates based on a belief that you have higher yields is not going to fly under a regulatory system. There was a general belief that higher yields meant also more nitrogen was needed. And those of you that saw Tom's uh, presentation will recognize that that is really not supported by data. We have limited funds to reevaluate the book values, and we also have yield monitors in the fields now. So we get these maps, and the map shows a lot of variability within those fields. So Yield potentials per sort of type may not capture all of the variability, the real variability that exists there. Farm and field specific data would always be better. So with this as issues, we also had some opportunities, and the opportunities came in two ways. The first way was that uh, NRCS embraced this adaptive management concept. Remember NRCS 590 standard was referring it was part of the CAFO permit, referring back to our guidelines. When NRCS officially embraced the adaptive management process for nutrient management, it opened up a window for us in the state of New York to implement something that made a lot more sense to a lot more people than to simply have an equation that says use this, or to say you have to have three years of yield data, and with that number you can override the equation without further adjustments in anything. Now, one thing that stood out that was really uh, illustrative is farmers coming back and say, you're a yield potential database. It says 120 bushels an acre. I get a lot more, but I have no yield data. And by the way, I can never get more than is in these book values if you don't allow me to fertilize more. Right? So if I have to stick to Cornell University guidelines and I believe, truly believe that they are keeping me back from higher yields, then how do you get there without violating your CAFO permit? So we look for a more inventive way to get around that, to allow people to experiment, to build the databases, and to get some, some new science in place and some trust that we are moving forward. And technology advances really allowed us to do that. And with technology advances, I mean yield monitors, ways to measure yield. Now you might think we should have done that a long time ago, um, the grain yield monitors were there, but as you might recall, I said in the beginning, there was a lot more silage than grain. Uh, the silage monitors, the farm with the longest term records that we are working with right now in terms of silage records that are believable is 10 years only. That is a fairly short history. The yield monitors for silage that are now generating data and sharing that with us, most of them have three to four years of data and not more than that. So we were limited in our update, in, in terms of updating the book values if you don't have access to yield data. But technology allowed uh, for that to happen. Now, this adaptive management in, uh, in uh, NRCS, uh, Tom can tell you all about the, uh, probably all three of those, right? Yeah, I wrote them. All right. <laughs> so um, the first one in 2011, we picked it up and said, okay, here's our window. Here's what we can do with this. Um, um, sorry? That's oh, excellent. <laughs> so 
couple of key things in this document, the first document and the, and the other two too. Uh, data collected at the field level, field by field assessments. That was important to us. And then it requires evaluation. So as Tom talked about, it's a, it's a process of putting a plan for evaluation in place, getting some data, evaluating the data, and then making decisions based on that. Continuous evaluation, field-based level, and an evaluation step. So in New York, um, there were some options to do that. The very first document, Tom, if I remember well, it said that we needed six replications of uh, five end rates, yeah. and we could then base uh, our, our new recommendations on the results of those replicated trials with five end rates. Now, I fully support the five end rates. Absolutely important if you want to find out what the optimum rate is. Um, but what's the issue with this? Anybody see any issues with getting every farm to do this on every field where they want to figure out what the optimum end rate is? First of all, it's a lot of work. Secondly, what's the main issue here? So the consultants that, work, that we worked with for this trial um, and uh, the company that took the picture said, wow, that's beautiful. Wow, wow, this is really showing the nitrogen deficiency, right? On the left is a zero, and then a 50, 100, 150, 200. You can see that the zero was deficient, the 50 is probably two, and 100, 150 is getting better. Research purposes, perfect. This was one of the best R squareds I ever saw on the trial. He showed it to the farmer, and the farmer said, what do you think he said? I don't like these yellow strips. <laughs> Right? So it's not just labor intensive, it's also resulting in, in giving up quite some yield uh, if a field is truly responsive. Um, so we can't expect to implement this as the adaptive management process for every single field that a farmer wants to overwrite the recommendations for. That's just not practical. So we continue to work on these trials, they're very useful, um, but we added a, a, another option. So in 2013, we released two new fact sheets in our fact sheet series, and these uh, really that added two more options. So we still retained the other two, follow the equation, use your own yield values. Number three was on-farm replicated trials, like the picture I showed you. Number four was the, adaptive man the true adaptive management option, and it said you can overwrite the numbers, but if you do without having your yield data, but if you do, you have to start measuring yield from there on and you have to take corn stock nitrate tests and manage the numbers to be below 3,000 ppm. The research suggests 2,000 is plenty. Um, we said 3,000 because there's spatial variability, there's, there's variability over time. So that was the true adaptive management option. Now, in terms of uh, these fact sheets, the real important part here, the adaptive management process was not a Cornell thing. This is a really important thing. It shows up at the back of the fact sheets at the bottom. This is co-ordered by Cornell, Cornell Cooperative Extension, the DUC, the regulator, NRCS as the standard, the agency that developed the, the, the standard, and by um, the Department of Ag and Markets, who has the AEM, Ag and Environmental Management Program. So all agencies agreed on this, signed off on it, and put it in place. All right. So the corn stock nitrate test, just a brief, uh, brief component here for that. New York interpretation says excess over 2,000. The lowered potential for deficiencies, but what we are really looking for in terms of the CSNT, they captured the very high numbers. The numbers where we know that uh, there was more nitrogen available to the crop than it needed, and where we might have opportunities to fine tune our management and get better field balance in place. So report card at the end of the season. The reason why this works so well is because a corn plant that gets more nitrogen than it needed tends to accumulate that nitrate in the bottom of the stalk. This is the distribution of uh, corn stock nitrate uh, levels from the ground up, the zero to one, that is the ground, all the way up to 18 inches. And when, it's more, when it gets more nitrogen than it needed, it accumulates in the bottom and therefore we can use it as an indicator of excess nitrogen at the end of the season. All right. So it fits the adaptive process really, really well. 
you get a number that is too high, you realize, okay, I can go back, maybe I can reduce my uh, fertilizer replication rate a little bit next year, you lower it a little bit, and then you test again. And you keep looking at the yield, and you keep looking at this until it's in the optimum zone. And I'm really not advocating continuous corn here. The idea was to just evaluate and see if we can move it in the right direction. It responded very well to manure applications. An example of a uh, farm with uh, uh, manure injection rates, 9,000, 12,000, 15,000 gallons, where the season T went up um, with additional manure beyond what it needed. No crop response in terms of yield to the higher rates. And it showed up in individual trials. This is just one example where one of the extension educators went in and applied an extra 40 pounds uh, side by side next to one where he didn't do that. And we see it reflected in the C's and T's. There is an issue with the C's and T's in terms of variability even in fields. And um, that is related to, to um, inherent variability in any of our fields. How many of you have taken C's and T samples? Just a few of you. How many of you have taken soil samples? Quite a few more. All right. So our guidance, uh, uh, well, let's, let's ask you this. If, how many seeds per acre, cornfield? Ballpark? 32,000. 32, if I have a one acre field and I go in and I just close my eyes, I take one stalk, I cut it at the ground, take it out, weigh it, and I get a weight for that corn stalk, and I multiply it times 32,000, and I get a yield estimate. Do you trust that yield estimate? How many of you do trust that yield estimate? All right. Should I ask how many of you do not trust that yield estimate? <laughs> All right. The same holds for C's and T's. The same holds for soil sampling. So in terms of C's and T's, if you take too few samples, you have very well a chance that you not get accurate results to represent that area. We looked at that with a whole bunch of fields in New York, and basically we need three samples per acre to get within 22% of the true value of that acre. All right? No one, two, three. And you might think 22% is huge. Now, I actually find that acceptable in terms of, of CVs because we are looking for the high level samples, right? The regulatory step was 3,000 ppm. Even if I'm 22% off from 3,000, I'm still above the 2,000 critical value for the C's and T to start with. So if you, we basically were looking at fields that are five or six or 7,000 PPMs, and then the 22% really doesn't matter, right? So we've got to keep that in perspective. We're not, we're finding the excess areas, not the, the, the low ends. How many stops per sample? So our, our, we started off saying you need um, uh, one sample per acre. That was the default uh, for soil sampling as well. So if you have a 15 acre field, that would be 15 stocks. Together. What, no, one sample per field would be those combined. So if you have a 15 acre field, you would take 15 stocks and combine them into one sample. Yeah. All right. All right. So there's one thing that showed up with the C's and T's, and I think this is important moving forward. And that was its, the false negative, well, what is it, the false negatives, I guess. Um, the ones where the C's and T comes back low, and people start thinking, oh, I didn't have enough nitrogen. The top two fields, the top two uh, charts here, um, this is the yield for a particular year as a function of nitrogen applied. And in this year, this is uh, our research station, we saw no yield increase with the amount of nitrogen applied. But we also saw a low season T. This was a drought year. We only had 120 bushels an acre. The season T was low. If you only looked at the season T, you would have said, oof, I, I didn't have enough. I needed more. Another year, the same field, 2014, good growing season. We had two, 216 bushels an acre for this particular field at the optimum end rate. Uh, we needed nitrogen to get there. The season T at the zero end rate was low. There, it correctly identified that I needed more nitrogen. The big difference between those two years can be seen when you look at the yield over the C and T ratio. 
if the yield over the C and T ratio is low, something else might be limiting your yield other than nitrogen. And drought is a prime one for that. But it could also be wheat pressure. Uh, it could be some pest problem, whatever, whatever you can think of. If that yield over C and T ratio is high, much better. Um, you, can, you, can be, you can trust the C and T values much better. All of this research was going in the direction of we need to not sample the whole field at one acre, one sample per acre, but we need to sample the yield zones. So our adaptive management policy was upgraded in 2018. Remember the first policy was you use the equation and the book values or you um, use your own yield data or you do replicated trials or you can override everything with your belief of higher yield values but if you do so you have to measure yield and take the C's and T's. We changed that to saying you need to take your C's and T's from the top 25 percent yield area of the field not the whole field. Target your sampling for more believable numbers, um, more explainable numbers. You now also have the option of putting in a, a check strip you can have the option of, if the field is really impacted by drought or anything else, to just take pictures, and then you don't have to take the C's and T anymore. And uh, we had to have an option for crops other than corn. Right now, that is a field balance option. We also added to all of this um, the option of uh, not having to do any of these evaluations if the whole farm balance for nitrogen is below 105 pounds per acre. And the whole farm balance is based on looking at the imports of nutrients onto the farm and the exports of nutrients, taking the difference and dividing it by the total acreage that the farm is using. So a farm that has a three-year three running average based on this assessment that's in the green box doesn't do, have to do any of the field evaluations. They are already showing that they are doing a good job with their nitrogen use efficiency on the farm. That's what we have in place right now. This is a document where you can download and, and see the details. Um, we are requiring yield measurements for all of the adaptive management options, including the mass balance. You need that anyway to get a mass balance. <laughs> um, farmers with yield monitors can uh, now set their own yield-specific goals, their yield-specific uh, yield potentials if they have three years or more of data. We are redoing our yield potential database for people that don't have the ability to measure yield. We're working with farms with yield monitor data. They are donating their data. It is generating histograms like this where we now have almost 10,000 data points for, uh, what is this, grain, and, almost, and a little more for silage data. So people are donating their databases to update the statewide yield potential database. But farmers that have their own records are much better off using their own records and not the book values. So we are uh, continuing these steps, continuing to work on this, and I really hope we're investing heavily into this right now. I really hope we can uh, make better use of all the sensors that we have access to now. That's crop sensors on the field level. It is yield monitors with their sensors. It is satellites. It is drone captured images. Um, there's huge potential now for that type of technology to help us with our yield determinations. And if we can make that easier to do for farmers, then the adaptive management process can be implemented on a much, much bigger scale than it currently can. I had a last uh, lessons learned slide. I'm out of time. Five minutes? Yes, five minutes. All right. Um, the focus that we went by in New York was to look at productivity and environment at the same time. I would never advocate shortening yield. Um, that's not the way to go. You just create leaky systems. So we want to go with optimum crop production while protecting the environment, which means we don't want to exceed the optimum rate too greatly. Um, we want to get as close as we can, and certainly not go below the optimum end rate. Um, the involvement of all our key players in the state was extremely important. If it had just been Cornell saying one thing, we would have gone nowhere. It was the partnership we have with counterparts uh, in the state, the state agencies, agricultural industry partners, the farm advisors, the farms that uh, participated in their whole farm mass balance assessments and their field trials were all essential for getting this type of uh, things in place. 
Um, the adaptive management process allowed us to build a tent and say, you can embrace any form of technology, whether that is a model that tells you how much you need, or a satellite image, or a grandpa, or um, I don't know, who else has uh, insights into particular fields? It doesn't matter what is driving the decisions. It can be used under a regulatory tent that was built because of adaptive management policies. But it comes with the responsibility to measure yield and to evaluate if your adaptive management, your alternative, actually was an improvement over the foundational recommendations. To me, that's the way to go um, in terms of building a science database as well. And we're lucky in the state of New York with so many farms that are now donating their, their data so we can actually update and make use of the yield data that do exist. That was it. Any questions? <laughs>